contact and nobody from Philadelphia Police has contacted me here. They don't know how, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, my contact with the New York Police has been at first what I expected. I expected them to see me as a traitor and to be for the protesters and to be totally against me. I had a very, very fine line to walk uh, between supporting the between supporting the protesters, but also letting the police know I was not against them. Mm -hmm. I was against their the actions mandated by the mayor. Mm -hmm. But you just can't get that message across right away. And uh, a lot of you are too young to remember the Walenda brothers. The Willenda brothers, it was a family of tight, they would string ropes from building to building. And Niagara Falls. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And they would like walk this tight rope. And that's what I feel I'm doing, trying to walk the tight But I'm not, I'm not a tight rope walker. No. So sometimes I go too much on this side a little bit, the police see me, and sometimes the occupiers see me going towards the police too much. Mm -hmm. uh, because certain things I say are in defense of the police. Mm -hmm. And so they, they automatically uh, assume, ah, oh, he's really a cop. Then another big thing that was um, working against me was, usually you're a police infiltrator, and we need them, by the way, you need that part of your force, mm -hmm. at least to infiltrate certain uh, groups. But usually it's the, the person who looks the same as the rest of the group. And he's going to, he or she is going to fit in. Mm -hmm. Like you would, you would not have me coming up and trying to infiltrate the group. No. Except, oh, whoa, no, but except there's that thing about now the occupiers were thinking, this is maybe reverse psychology. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're sending in a cop to, you know, who is a cop to try to gain trust. Like, And then once we trust him and we start, start telling him, he's really an informer. And in fact, none of you don't even know that. I could possibly be an informer for the Philadelphia Police Department. I have tried to maintain a low level here. I have never asked to join me. I come here, I change, I hold my sign. Mm -hmm. After the night is over, I come here, I put my raincoat on, so I'm, you know, I, don't, I don't want to go through the city like this. Uh, and I go back. And so I never went up to, I never asked, excuse me, who's your leader? Mm -hmm. Or, excuse me, I'd like to speak at one of your general assemblies. Or what do you have planned next? Mm -hmm. I say nothing, because I knew they would have to come to me. Mm -hmm. Okay? And just the other night was the first night that I spoke about a general assembly. And when they hear me, I was invited. Mm -hmm. I did not ask. Okay. Uh, but when they hear me speaking, what I'm saying is I'm not inquiring about anything they're, do they, they're going to do. Okay? And when they hear the, what I'm saying is I'm trying to educate them about, even going back to the police hiring process, the police hiring process is part of this problem. Before the, the person even becomes a police officer, they're, they, they're the, um, the most popular personality test to determine if you're right for a job or not is called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Test. This, this is uh, like a hundred questions. They're very simple questions. It doesn't take intelligence. What it takes is they want to see what your personality is like. And like some of these questions was, uh, were, if you had preferred to take a walk through the woods and photograph butterflies, or fix a, uh, an automobile engine, which would you prefer to do? Simple things like that. But when you have a hundred of those questions, that creates a personality type. And here's the unfortunate part in that. This is part, and there's, there's other parts, obviously, of the recruitment process, but that test is one of them. That test, excuse me one minute. Uh, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory Test. Uh, part of that measures a person's sensitivity level. All right, and you can be you can come out on that test extremely sensitive down here. That you start to cry if you see an injured animal, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that'll measure that type of sensitivity all the way up here. That it doesn't bother you if you see somebody getting killed right in front of your eyes. All right. Now you want to reach for police work. That is very important. You cannot hire this person down here because they're not going to last a day on the job. All right. But what happens is, instead of going for the sen and the other reason they don't go for the sensitive, forget down here. Even up here, they don't hire that sensitive officer because of the fact that they have to put six months of training into that officer. That's a lot of money, a lot of time. And that person, even if they're close to the average, is more likely to quit the job after he endures 
the the um, depressing aspects of this job. Not only the guts and gore, but if you work in an economically depressed city, it is very depressing every single day. So if you're too sensitive, you're going to quit today. So the city lost money in investing and educating that person. But they don't see, all right, now you go above that average line and you hire the hard ass. Well, guess what? He costs you millions, or she, costs you millions more money of, of money than this person in lawsuits because they're physical abusing people. And so when you, and that, that's 15 million a lawsuit, 10 million, 5 million. And also the other damage that does is not even monetarily. It's the, the damage this hard ass does to encourage support between the people in the community. This guy makes the community lose support. I mean respect. Yeah. And once they lose respect, they lose support of the police. And you, it's vital that all police departments have the respect of the community. Yeah. So you lose that. So my thing is, and this pe people can do this, uh, find out, are you, and by the way, it's the most usually, at least it was when I retired eight years ago, it is the most used, widely used personality questionnaire in the country. Even corporations use it, all businesses use it. They want to see if your personality fits in, because any business does not want to train you and hire you, and then you quit. And uh, I would strongly advise, see if this test is still used, and try to get it reversed. Instead of hiring the guy above the average level of sensitivity, hire the person below it. Because also one thing with police work, I guarantee you, because it happened to me, and I didn't think it would, but my sensitivity level, within the first year, I became less sensitive. Mm -hmm. okay. I became less sensitive. Uh, and, it ha and we're all humans, and that's, it's part of human nature. Uh, when you're constantly bombarded with this type of uh, environment, it's just self-protection that you become less sensitive or you'll be destroyed. So my sensitivity level, I wasn't down here, but let's say my sensitivity level was here. And like I said, I got harder, but it went up, but it didn't go up to here. But when you start here or here, and that's, and that's the, the man in California, you're all familiar with the University of California, Davis, yes. with the pepper spray. Yeah. That man, when he was hired, was up here, okay? Then he went sociopath. And so that man should have never even been hired. Uh, and look how much money it's costing them. Look mm -hmm. how much money. I would much rather hire a sensitive person down here, somewhere in this range, and they quit, and you lost six months of training. You didn't lose any public support, okay? And you, there was no money lost either. This man was, uh, the, the chancellor of the university uh, is going to have to resign now. Mm -hmm. Because she was responsible, I think, for not responding to complaints about this officer. But she was responsible for his hiring. Yeah. Yeah, so it goes.